Give a praise God hand for Mr. True Pettigrew. Praise God, praise God. Let's give a round of applause for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please stay, remain standing while we have a quick word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity for us to come together. Not only for the fellowship, Lord, but for the opportunity to praise and worship you Lord, you inhabit the praises of your people, and we truly feel your presence in this place today. Lord, we count it as an honor and a privilege to praise and worship you. And I know that you have a message for your people today, dear Heavenly Father, and I pray that you allow those that are here today to receive your message, dear Lord Jesus, to open their eyes, their ears, their hearts, and their minds to Receive the word that you have for them, Lord. Touch me, your messenger, that your words will be on my lips and that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Feels good to be home. You may be seated. Now, not just because I'm... Um, Originally from Baltimore, it feels good to be home, but when I speak, I speak at a lot of different places, and so it feels good to be home because I'm in my father's house right now. So it really feels good to be home. As you heard the, the, the young lady say, I am a, I'm a speaker, so I go around and, and speak. So if anyone hears anything today that sounds remotely like preaching, and just don't tell anybody, and all right? So y'all gonna just have to forgive me because uh, if the spirit moves, that's just what happens sometimes, amen? amen. Now, the, 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 the lovely young lady that was up here singing, and I gotta tell you, there's a, a, a scripture that says you can tell a tree by its fruit. And so all I could think is she must have some incredible parents. That's all I can think, yes. <laughs> And what some of you may or may not know is I am her father. <laughs> so I bear good fruit, I bear good fruit. <laughs> so I spent a large part of my career, most of my career, focused on multicultural marketing. And I would help companies and brands understand how to effectively reach multicultural audiences. And a lot of times that would require helping them understand what drives them and moves them and motivates them. And in doing that, I realized that a lot of these companies would get caught up in the traditions of how they would do things and that would create an obstacle for them really understanding how to effectively reach multicultural audiences. And what I also realized in doing that is that it requires true diversity and inclusion when you're looking to effectively reach multicultural audiences. And that there is a difference in the generations in how we even define multicultural. And I noticed that a lot of the ad agencies, the black agencies, if you will, there, 
there were a lot of really strong, popular black ad agencies that were in existence for years because most companies and brands out there felt like, okay, if I want to understand how to reach the black community, I need to go to a black advertising agency. And that held to be true for a long time. And then something happened over the, over the recent years is a lot of the black ad agencies started to fall away. And there, there was a, a demise of the black ad agency. And what happened, ladies and gentlemen, is the, and this may sound a little weird, but the black ad agencies stopped understanding how to reach black people. <laughs> now, now, what kind of sense does that make? Abs thank you, and absolutely none. So they stopped understanding how to reach black people and that was because as the generations were shifting and the generations were changing, they got caught up in doing things the way that they were accustomed to doing them based on their generation. So they got caught up in the traditions of what historically, or, or better yet, stereotypically, what they thought was black and the stereotypical definitions of blackness. So I'm so proud and excited when I, when I had my conversation with Bishop and we were talking about Multicultural Month and, and this being Black History Month, you know, as, as we know it, but that Bishop referenced it as Multicultural Month. And when we started talking and we were talking about his, his vision and his perspective, I was on other, I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, he gets it. And it's funny, because I really thought, and I've you know, known Bishop for some time, and I really felt like, man, this, this guy is just is brilliant. But it's funny how you think that when people agree with your point of view, you just, you, <laughs> you just feel, oh yeah, he agreed, this man is sharp. I was telling everybody how smart he was, but it's because, you know, I was like, because you know, I think that way too. Now, so what happens is we get so caught up in traditions, and now one of the things that this group in the church I have the benefit of sharing with you is that I didn't necessarily have the benefit of sharing with my corporate audiences and my corporate counterparts is we have a, a reference book that's a little different than the reference book that they use. So we, we have some guiding principles that are just a little different than the guiding principles and values that they base things on. So if y'all don't mind, I, I can share a little bit of insight and perspective and, and direction with you today that I didn't necessarily share with my counterparts. And maybe if I had, and this was a lesson that God taught me when I was in corporate in the last couple of years, is that maybe I should have. Because one of the things that I realized that I was guilty of is compartmentalizing God. Now, I don't know, and I'm not, I'm, I'm, pre, I'm speaking to myself right now, because I know nobody here, not, nobody else in here does that. So I, I'm just speaking to myself right now, so y'all can just take this information and tell the people who are guilty of it like me, so y'all can share that with those other people, because I know it's nobody in here. All right, so I was guilty of when I would go to the workplace, I said, okay, I'm going to play by the work rules and use the rules and the guidelines to communicate to them so I was compartmentalizing God, but you know, being a man of God and, and knowing that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, when I left work, when I would go to home, go home, I would do my ministry at home or I would do ministry at church. But when I got back to work, I was playing by the work guidelines and the work rules. So maybe if I had used the same reference book that you guys use here, then I could have saved some of those companies that fell by the wayside. Maybe some of those black agencies would still be in existence right now. They would understand how they could have maintained some sustainability. So, and I just say to say, I say this to say to you guys, and I just wanna go to a quick reference in, in the book that you use, if you don't mind, real quick. So, I'm gonna go to Colossians 2.8. And, and God spoke to me, and God is so good. Because as I was preparing for this, he just shared this with me in my preparation. So in Colossians 2.8, and I'm reading from the King James Version, it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition 
of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that spoke to me and I felt convicted because I got caught up in the traditions of, of man and of the world and not realizing that it's not, I mean, I think the, 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 the uh, um, uh, uh, Pastor Pat said, it's not about us, right? It's not about us. And so I got caught up in following the traditions of man. But one of the lessons that I've learned is that I, I need to allow my light to shine through the darkness in the world. And we can't let the darkness eclipse our light. Right. And so I think I found myself in a place where I was looking to conform to these traditional ways of man and not allowing Christ to lead the way. But thanks be to God that I now understand that I cannot compartmentalize God. So whether it's at the workplace, whether it's at the, the gym, when I'm shooting that ill baseline jumper that I still have, and it's, yes, it's still wet, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, it is. Even at 45 years old, I should have been out in Houston right now this weekend, but I'm here with y'all. But that's all right. But I understand no matter where I am that it's ministry and that this is always relevant it's always relevant. And so what we need to understand, ladies and gentlemen, is that as we are looking to make sure that we don't get caught up in the traditions and God revealed to me, well, the same message that you are sharing with these corporate brands, whether it's Nike, whether it's Verizon, whether it's Sprint, whether it's Home Depot, it's like the, the word doesn't change. Now, what God revealed to me is you need to just make it relevant to the audience that you're talking to. And you know, you need to make sure that you're being the most effective speaker, the most effective minister that you can be because the word doesn't change. So the onus was on me to just make it relevant. So this applies to the church as well. And so what I wanna caution us today, and granted, so I'm telling y'all this so y'all can tell the other folks who are guilty of this, cause I know that doesn't apply here, but that we need to be careful that we don't get caught up in, th in the traditions of the black church. Because what'll happen is you may end up just like some of those black ad agencies that are no longer in existence. Now, a lot of times when we are reaching out to our young people and we are instilling these traditions in them, those traditions are important, they're significant, they matter. But at the same time, we have to understand that, and I believe this, and now we, all have a purpose. We all have an individual purpose. God has given us gifts that we need to use and the way we use those gifts are our gift back to God. So we all have individual gifts and we all have collective gifts. That's the church, that's the body of the church so that we all come together and we have a collective purpose as the body of the church. So we have our individual purpose and our collective purpose. Now, this is, once again, this is me saying this. I believe that there is also a generational purpose. Each generation has a purpose that they need to fulfill and that they, based on the things that are happening in that time and culture at that time, will dictate and determine how they need to go about doing that and what that challenge is for that generation. But we have to be careful that we don't get caught up in trying to instill our black traditions on our young people so that we don't give them the freedom to do the things that God has gifted and called and purposed them to do. Now, I, I, what I see happening so many times is we don't realize that this is a new era with new expressions and new expectations. And I wanna say that again, this generation, what we call the millennial generation, this is a new era with new expressions and new expectations. Now, I wanna try something for a second here. Where's my 20 and, and under crew? Anybody 20 and under? Anybody 20 and under, okay? 20 and under? Come on, put your hands up. Let me see, 20 and under crew. I want to see what representation is in here right now. I'm going to do a generational roll call. Where's my 30 and under crew? Okay, got a little more. 
See, that's still, that's still millennial. All y'all, y'all still the millennial generation. Okay, where's my, where's my over 30 crew? See, all right, so now, see, I ain't gonna do the 40, 50, I ain't gonna do that to y'all. So I'ma just stop right there, my, thir my 30 and over. I'ma stop right there. <laughs> but once, after that, the, the over 30, you guys are the leaders. And you have a responsibility to the younger generation. Each generation has a responsibility to that next generation to teach them and mold them and shape them and guide them. But you need to understand what their drivers are, what the motivators are, what moves them. And instead of just saying, hey, you need to do this because I said do it, you need to help them understand why it's important to do these things. And then understand that they have new ways, new era, new expressions, new expectations. They have new ways of doing things. I was at a conference once, and, and I'm not going to call any names. I'm not going to say where or what. But it just struck, it, it struck me that the, the, the young lady that was preaching and ministering to a group of pastors, she said that I want everybody to pull their Bibles out. Now, everybody have their Let me see the Bibles. Let me see the Bibles right now. Everybody... Now see, I see a beautiful thing because I see some tablets, I see some iPhones, and this young woman, well, well she's not really that, she wasn't really that young, but <laughs> this, this woman, because she was an older woman, and she said, now I want to see Bibles. The way I was raised, you brought your Bible to church. I'm tired of seeing all of these little phone devices and all of these other things. I want to see Bibles. Now, that just struck me the wrong way because if they are accessing the word and reading the word, then you shouldn't get caught up in the traditions that you in which you were raised because now you're creating a, a wedge between you and that generation and that's how we end up with those generation gaps. That, that, and we can't afford for that to happen because what happens is you turn that generation away. They, they're, not, they're not comfortable coming to the, your, your, your place of worship. They're not comfortable receiving from you because they feel like you don't understand them. You don't get them. And this is the way, and I, it's funny, one of the young people, <laughs> one of the young people whispered under his breath and I wish she had heard him. She's like, well, Moses used tablets. And I was, <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying. But then one of the things I, I want to share with you also, and, and, and God revealed this to me, and I was like, man, God, I wish I had thought of this. It was just so good. Is that in 1 Samuel 17, 39, you, you guys are very familiar with this story. It's the story of David and Goliath. All right, 1 Samuel 17, 39. And I'm going to read the 1739, but we're going to review the, the rest of the story as well. So, and once again, I'm reading out of King James. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. Now, see, what, I don't know if y'all see this. Some of y'all already see what's happening. When David, let's, let's just back up for a little minute just to understand the differences in the generation. Because what I want you guys to understand is as we sometimes get caught up in, in the black agenda and in, 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 in the black church or the black this and the black that, that's okay because we understand the importance of making sure that we even the playing field. That is very important. So we can't ignore that and we don't want to dismiss that. But we also have to understand the impact of diversity and the power of diversity. And so it's so funny that when we talk about diversity and inclusion, and that's something that I talk about and speak about all the time, we as black people think that's something white people have to do. <laughs> is that they need to diversify and include us more in the workplace and in this place and in that place. That's something that white people, the onus is on them to diversify and include. But I challenge some of, of, of well, maybe not you guys, because I know that y'all are extremely diverse and inclusive in your daily lives. But I talked to some of 
some of my black friends and some of the places where I go to speak and I understand what is your daily life look like? What does your life look like on a weekly basis? And so you're married to someone black, your children are black, the people you have dinner with and go to the movies with are black, the people that you socialize with and do this and that with are black, and a lot of them only listen to black music and go to black movies. So where's your diversity and inclusion? And then you have an expectation of your counterparts to diversify and include, but then you have no diversity and inclusion. And what that does, it strengthens an organization. Now, I apply this to corporate, but the same holds true for the black church or for any church. It strengthens an organization to have diverse experiences and exposure to different things and to have different perspectives and a different way of looking at things. And what's going on right now with this millennial generation, ladies and gentlemen, is they truly embrace diversity. And unless we understand that, we're not gonna really be able to properly connect with and resonate with them and understanding how they truly embrace diversity and don't necessarily see things through the same lens that the older generation sees things through. But that's okay, because each generation has a purpose. And our generation, we have hopefully fulfilled our purpose, and now we have to understand that this next generation has a purpose, and I believe it has a lot to do with embracing diversity and bridging that, that gap, that ethnic and that racial divide. And so we need to be aware of that. And I, one of the things that comes to mind is, and I'm gonna get back to David, but one of the things that comes to mind is if when we say multicultural, most of the people in here probably think black, or Hispanic, am I, am I right? Now, I would tell you that most of the people in this millennial generation, they look at it for the true meaning of the word, multi-cultures. They just look at it across the board and embracing diversity on so many different levels. So we need to realize that if this is how this generation is viewing things and looking at things, we need to understand the impact that diversity is having on them, thus the impact that it has on the way we relate to them. Because one of the things that my challenge is with corporate America is to help them recruit and retain more young people. And then I, as I go around, I'm understanding that seems to also be a challenge in the church is to recruit and retain young people. But if you don't understand the real attitudes, influences, opinions, and motives, then it's gonna be hard for you to recruit and retain young people. So they don't see things, they don't view themselves in the stereotypical definition of society's definition historically of blackness. Now, a lot of us, when we raised our hands, and I'm sure when we get to the 40 and more, 40 and over, 50 and over, and so on, when, now how many of y'all have used the phrase, oh man, that's, that's white people stuff. <laughs> Come on, I'll, I'll just, just, just us four. Just, just, just us four, we the only ones that, we only ones have used that phrase, oh, that's white people stuff. Now, I guarantee you, you talk to some folks in this younger generation and you use that terminology and you use that phrase and they're going to kind of look at you a little confused and, and say, well, I actually like going bungee jumping. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> but I'm just saying, that's not me. They say, I actually like going snowmobiling. I, I like going skydiving and I like skateboarding and I like, you know, REM and, and, and I like, you know, all of these different styles of clothes and fashion and music and activities because they truly, not only are they heavily influenced by diverse cultures, but they are inspired and they seek out diversity. It is just a regular part of their lifestyle. And until we understand that, they're gonna look at us as people that are just, uh, just relics. And then, then we can't relate to them and connect with them for something as simple that we should be doing anyway. I mean, I just think if Jesus didn't have a diversity and inclusion initiative, my God, where would we be? 
Man, I am so glad I can receive the blessings of Abraham. Y'all looking at a black Jew on stage right now because I can receive the blessings of Abraham because Jesus had a diversity and inclusion initiative. So it's something that we should be doing anyway. All right, so now there's this, uh, there's, there's this just young rapper uh, out of New York. And I just want to quote something from him just to give you the mindset of young people today. Uh, got Red Cafe, all right, kid out of Brooklyn. He says, when it comes to my style, you know I stay the cleanest. My lifestyle, no speaky, no English. I got a Spanish mommy and a German whip. Japanese jeans and Japanese kicks. I rock Italian suits and eat Chinese food, but still maintain a New York attitude. Now, if I don't know if y'all follow where the young man was going with that, but basically that is the mindset of young people today. It is of a global mindset. Like this is his reality. These are the things that I'm exposed to. And not only am I influenced by these things, but I'm also influencing these other cultures. So I say this to say, black church, let's not get so caught up as, as, as Paul talks to us in, in Colossians and the traditions of the black church, but let us open ourselves up to truly embrace diversity. And that's why I'm so excited that Bishop has transformed this into not just Black History Month, and we can't ignore that. It is important, the contributions that our ancestors have made that allowed us to be where we are today, but we have to understand the impact of diversity on our society and on our culture and truly embrace diversity. Now, going back to David, so David showed up. David was a young man. I mean, you know, the, the scholars will say he was anywhere from 17 to 20. So David was a young guy when he rolled up on the scene. You had all of the uh, Israelites about to, you know, they, you know, about to do battle with the Philistines. So this is about to go down. And so David just rolled up. He was supposed to bring something down there for his brothers. And he's like, oh, man, what's going on down here? There's a lot of commotion going on. What's going on down here? And he overheard some dudes talking about, yeah, man, this, this, this dude Goliath, man, I don't know. Like, this dude kind of on swole. Like, we, can't, we can't really see this dude. So, and he overheard them talking about whoever could take this dude out, what they're going to receive. So he was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Say that again. So... The, the, the king's daughter, where's she at, how she look? Okay, all right, so okay, all right, word, word, word. So what else, oh, you gonna get some, you gonna get some paper too? And we gonna remove the debts? My pops ain't got, my pops is out of debt? Oh man, let me see this Goliath dude. All right, so he's like, okay, so his brother's like, yo man, look little man, like, you gotta get out of here, this this grown folk stuff. Like, you don't know nothing about this. This grown folk stuff, you got beat a little David, shoo, get out of here. And so they were like, hold up, hold up. He had to hear it again. So he has heard it again, heard from somebody else. He's like, okay, so let me say, I think I can do this. So Saul found out that it's somebody that's willing to go out there and see this dude. So Saul was like, all right, little man, let me see. So if you really try and see this dude, this is what it's going to take. He was like, go ahead and put on this armor because this is how we do things around here. All right, say, put on this, put on this breastplate, you know, put on this helmet, you know, put on this little, this little sheath, you know, get the sword. So David tried all this stuff, stuff on, and he's like, yo, I can't rock with this. I, I, I can't rock with this. He's like, I tell you what, I'm going to go out there with my iPad. I'm going to go out there with my iPhone. I'm going I'm to I'm create an app real, I'm going to create this giant killing app real quick, and I'm going to go out here, and I'm going to take this dude out. All right? So what that's telling us, ladies and gentlemen, is each generation has its purpose. Each generation has its way of doing things. But, but, but follow me, follow me. One of the things that prepared and equipped David to be able to go out here and take Goliath out with, the, with his slingshot and his five smooth stones, you know, and his iPad app was that 
He lived a life of diversity. He saw things differently. He did things differently. While all of those dudes, their, their experiences were fighting other soldiers, David had diversity. David took out a lion. Okay, I got some diversity. David took out a bear. I got some diversity. So David had experiences that this, his current generation didn't have. Now, so we have to understand that and we have to really give the, the, the latitude to these young people and understand how to encourage them in their embracing of diversity and take a lesson from that and embrace diversity ourselves. And so I say that to say, ladies and gentlemen, let's just encourage our young people, open the doors for our young people, and take the responsibility that our generation has in pouring into them. And one of the things that, once again, going back to the word of God, is that when, when David went out there without all of those things, without all of that arm and all of that equipment, it was undeniable that it was the work of God that defeated that giant. And so that's one of the things that we have to keep in mind when we are trying to instill our traditional ways on young people, our stereotypical ways on young people, is that God has a plan. You know, Jeremiah 29, you know, God knows the plans he has for each of us. And so if we equip young people to do the things that are done in a traditional way, then we could easily get caught up in believing that it was because of us that they succeeded. So, and if they go out and do things based on the gifts that God has equipped them with to deal with the current generational issues and times, and then we will step back and say, my God, apps, yes, my God. Like, that is how they were able to do that. Because if you equip them with the things that you provided, you will easily deceive yourself to want to take the credit for why they were able to receive that victory. All right, and so or I, I wanna wrap up real quick because I know I'm running out of time, but one of the things I wanna say to the young people is with the beautiful implementation of technology, modern technology and social media and all of the things that are in place that allow you to see things differently and do things differently, be careful not to ignore the lessons from the older generation. Then just because we're gifted, you're gifted and you have the ability and the capability to do things with a lot more efficiency it may seem, a lot faster it may seem. Let's not get it twisted and thinking that that is a way or an avenue or a path to take shortcuts. Because I'm here to tell you right now, there are no shortcuts. Okay, so you have to put in the work. Now you hear a lot of, this the story is just so funny to me, when. You, you hear the, the older generation talk about walking to school uphill both ways in the snow, so always telling that story. But there's a lesson in that, is that you have to put in the work. Now, we can't expect our next generation to walk to school uphill both ways. And why would they? Why would you don't have to? So if you don't have to, do, don't do, then you don't need to do it. But I say, young people, that there is a lesson to be learned from the older generation. So take time to listen to them and understand the importance of process because there, there are no shortcuts. You have to put in the work, you know. And so it goes on to say that David prevailed. And so the message that God has given me for the young people, but I believe it applies to all of us, is that we need to prepare we need to perform, and then we will prevail. So the preparation is in studying the word of God, studying your craft. I don't care how gifted you are. You have to put in the work. Your gifts and your talents will only take you but so far. You have to put in the work, all right? And you have to keep God at the center of everything that you do. And then so after you prepare, study the word of God, study your craft, then you have to perform. You have to go out there and do it. You know, the same way that David went out there and he, he, he slayed him, he put him down. And then you will prevail. So my message is, is that there are no shortcuts and we have to prepare, perform, and prevail. And then we will succeed in the things that we're accomplishing and we're looking to accomplish. So ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your time today. I know I'm a little over time, but I, I got a little excited. And there's so much more that I would like to share, but Hopefully someone received a message today. Hopefully this word touched somebody today. And I thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you.